spoiled. David, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to visit you after we have met several times in Lindau. And uh, I taught you that the problems we have in biology are, of course, seen from the point of view of a physicist. Actually, I, you called me a chemist. I'm, I studied physics first, but I did much of my work in chemistry, fast reactions and so on. But uh, So I t told you also that I would be glad if there were biologists and physicists also, because I think there, there are some fundamental questions you could derive from the results we got in biology, fundamental questions to questions of origin at all and really what is information, uh, not Shannon information. I knew Claude Shannon personally very well uh, and uh, I think I share his view. He, he said, I'm always asked questions People ask for this information. My work is not really information. And he called what later has been called Shannon information. He called it uncertainty, which is a much better expression for what he was talking about. Well, let's see how far we get. Uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate to interrupt me. So uh, let me perhaps start uh, with quoting some uh, biologists, and there's also one physicist among it, and you might see what the problems are. Of course, the problem of the origin of life is an unsolved problem still. But uh, a number of questions coming up with it and still entertained nowadays uh, can be answered now and can be answered on the basis of uh, good results. In my own work in Göttingen, we did perhaps 20 or 30 percent theory and the rest was experimental work and my group uh, contained mathematicians, physicists, chemists, uh, biologists, and uh, uh, electro-engineers, and <laughs> so on. Okay, um, the, uh, let me perhaps start with some of the quotations. Uh, which, of course, I have to find. Yes, that's good. There was one very famous biologist in the last century, uh, one of the very great people quite close to here. I think he, he was at uh, Pasadena, uh, Theodosius Dobshansky. And he said once, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So the question of evolution is one we will have to talk about. We will uh, see. And the question when I say uh, is it a problem of physics is is there a physical, physical basis of evolution? Well, of course, uh, evolution was explained by Darwin through natural selection. Of course, at that time uh, when we studied the molecules to do it, and we discussed questions I used to say, Darwin knew of molecules as little 
as molecules new of Darwin, or <laughs> then of Darwin. And that's true. So uh, he de defined what he did, the natural selection, by saying the preservation, or oh, that's from the origin of species from his book, uh, this preservation of favorable individual differences and variations and the destruction of those which are injurious. I have called natural selection or the survival of the fittest. Well, the funny result of our studies is that formerly Darwin was entirely correct, still today. But as I said, he didn't know about the individuals which there the question that individual differences and variations is wrong. <laughs> also, natural selection, as many other properties in biology, are not properties of individuals, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, what makes natural selection is a property of the total population being present. You must not neglect the, new, uh, the mutants and among the mutants, many more neutral mutants, as biologists usually accepted to be there. We have done uh, site-directed mutagenesis uh, experiments. Most of the mutants we could uh, uh, produce and know what it, what it is were almost as good as the wild type, what was called the wild type. And later on we found that the wild type, which came out of an experiment on natural solution, even was hardly populated, but it was surrounded by good. And then if the, uh, the surrounding, the total surrounding is uh, very well uh, adapted to a process, then it looks as if the center were adapted, but it was, was only present in very low. Numbers. So uh, I say always already a little bit about the results because I know from experience that at the end the time becomes short and when one cannot uh, say everything one wanted to say. So formally here is completely right. There is a solution of the fittest. But physically you are many physicists here the fittest individuum is defined by an eigenvalue where all members of the population contribute to. So it's the property of the population, the populated uh, mutant spectrum which is present. Now, uh, the point of Darwin was uh, uh, perhaps best uh, uh, represented by a biologist, one of the great biologists in the last century, who became 103 years old, that is Ernst Meyer. But he, in earlier times, he said it has nothing to do with physics, and uh, and he considered myself uh, to be one of the, what did he say, hard, hardest, hard noses, uh, hard nosed uh, uh, representatives of the field. But Ernst Meyer came in Cambridge one day, we got both an honorary degree at the Cambridge University and excused at the age of over 90, which I found that's a, a nice, uh, I guess, uh, and said he, of course, didn't understand the work, and it turned out he really didn't understand anything about mathematics and physics, and so he asked uh, to be excused, and uh, otherwise he has done very great work in biology. And I think the fact that he uh, was looking at physics was that he was afraid biology could lose its uh, autonomy as a field of science. 
uh, which isn't true because it turns out that the properties which follow even from physical principles are so that they are realized only so far in biological systems. So what he said was living, he, in his recent books, he was already about 100 years old when he wrote this, uh, living organisms are adapted systems, the result of countless previous generations having been subject to natural selection. So he's one of the great uh, uh, followers of Darwin. These systems are programmed for telonomic, goal-directed in in brackets activities from embryonic development to the physiological and behavioral activities of the adults. Now, the book in which he writes is, uh, had the title, This is Biology, and appeared to be adapted considerably more to physics and chemistry than his uh, earlier uh, uh, books and, and what he said. Now, uh, it is certainly correct that we can clearly distinguish living organisms from inanimate matter. It's difficult to have a definition, but we, we, we know exactly this system is alive and this system is not alive. And, and so, uh, 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 I would like therefore to uh, also to quote here a physicist who gave a de uh, definition, at least what is physics, and that was Eugene Wigner, whom I knew personally also very well, but uh, he, he didn't believe in, in uh, that uh, we could explain biology in present physical terms, and he said there's even no reproduction of DNA. And as I come along in my lab and I show you in a little experiment in a few minutes a system where, where you have clear reproduction, he didn't do that. He, he knew that he would perhaps uh, see something he didn't like. But what he said is uh, uh, physics does not deal with processes. Physics deals with regularities among processes and only with regularities. That's a very good definition, wonderful definition. Physics. Now, uh, life certainly happens to be a regularity of, the, of uh, uh, processes, among processes. And uh, my theme is just the physical basis of these regularities. And so I will very soon, after a few slides here, uh, will show you uh, some experimental work we did on this question, on the origin of the genetic code. We, I think we were the first, but no one took uh, notice of it, to, to make a quantitative determination of the age. All other determinations said, yes, uh, there are some uh, structures found which look like cells, and so, so they said uh, these are older, geologically older than three billion, Yes, if I say billion now, I use American term for billion. In, in Europe, we have another word for it. Uh, so it's a thousand million. <laughs> it's ten to the nine. Uh, uh, and uh, yes, uh, we will see that we can get pretty good figure 
uh, with certain error limits, of course, for uh, this value by doing experiments. But let me first say that among biologists, they are by no means unified in saying what is the, what came first, what is the uh, main system for the origin of life. And I will show you briefly in the beginning three such assumptions which are made. Um, well, uh, there is first uh, the question that biological systems are. 20 minutes are already um. Oh, yeah. That's not schlimm. Well, first of all, uh, I should show you uh, transparency. Rutel has still uh, made yesterday here because I didn't bring it in. I will essentially talk about the transition from normal chemistry to biology, that means to life. Thank you. And that goes, here you have uh, all types of chemical, a very uh, rich chemical repertoire molecules, and the first which they have to, had to learn was reproduction and variation. Without reproduction, you will see that natural selection is a simple, direct physical consequence of reproduction at uh, limited growth. And uh, uh, that, and you will see the old question, which came first, the hen or the egg, has no answer which said they both had to come in a feedback relation at the same time. It started with a very primitive system, and today, what we see today is a very sophisticated system with hen and egg, and that appears in all living beings. But uh, so it, it will, this is the main thing for the origin, and we have to find out which of the properties is uh, first in importance, not in time. In time, you could say the, the uh, very uh, rich chemistry came certainly before any nucleic acid was among them, because that's one of the unsolved problems, how to make in a enzyme-free solution, uh, nucleic acids in a reproductive, reproducible way. So, uh, uh, also, you, you would see every living being has to be in a compartment, because otherwise you lose your stuff immediately after production. So, and we know ways of uh, uh, lipid vesicles which uh, can build in very primitive systems. But uh, compartmentation is not a typical problem of life. You can put any non-living system into a compartment and it doesn't become life by that. <laughs> so that is uh, also, and you see, then once you get uh, natural selection, you get also then evolution. And then, of course, uh, there are many, many open questions in uh, all the mechanisms. Uh, there, there might be ways of making life uh, in as many as we have li different living beings on Earth, and that's a quite a large number. Okay, so uh, one of the first uh, problems was what biologists also said, uh, cells first, and that means compartmentation. And one of the uh, real representatives of this was Lynn Margulis. She is a famous biologist. She has solved a famous problem in how uh, the uh, eukaryotic cells came about from a cooperation of 
prokaryotic and archaea bacterial cells. So she did excellent biological work, but she insists that first you must have a compartment. Now if you look at any compartment today, you see immediately what you need is not simply a compartment so that they can't uh, uh, go away or uh, you must also have substances which get in and the substances uh, of the substances produced in there not all should go out only very f only the, the uh, 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 those which which are of no use and if you look here at at any of the more modern uh, this is the microorganism uh, uh, the, I think it was done by uh, uh, the name of uh, um, yes, Burkhard Tümmler, who gave me this, this picture and the, the organism is with this pseudomonas uh, 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 Putida, yes, and KT2440. You see, it's one of the micro, is the unicellular microorganism. Now, this is the cell membrane which you see there. Oh, you see, what can I say? As you see, you see nothing. <laughs> and, and you shouldn't you shouldn't really see the details. I only want you to take the impression that must be a complex system because these are different uh, inlets and outlets. They l let only certain substan substances getting out or getting in. I think the red ones were out and the green ones in or vice versa. So any of these living systems has a compartment, which is a very, very complicated system. And that certainly cannot come about de novo. That must come of a natural selection. The next was Sidney Fox, who also did very excellent work in uh, uh, producing a substance which is similar, is made of amino acid residues, uh, and he called them proteinoids, not proteins, but proteinoids. And he showed that they have certain uh, catalytic properties, very bad ones. Uh, I mean, uh, our real enzymes uh, uh, can favor a reaction at a thousandfold or a millionfold, or, but and these were f few percent and and. Like the, but so he said, chemistry uh, 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 enzymes first. Now, if you look at any system nowadays, this is again a microorganism. That's the complexity of the chemistry involved there. That can't come about de novo. And you, we, we wouldn't know even a point how you can uh, realize natural selection with such a system. If you m make a mutant, that means if you change a little bit the uh, system as it always uh, will do, it will lose all its its property, all what it can do. So, and the third is, uh, uh, I will come to the nucleic acids and will show that they have the property you need but nowadays they are, uh, I showed you the, the pseudomonas. Can I have that one? Yes. And, but these are the different genes of pseudomonas. So it's also a very complicated system. And it, certainly there's no, in the so-called uh, uh, original soup, there's certainly nothing like like this, uh, which uh, uh, would have worked and which could form 
in, in, in any case. So, in other words, all we see today is so complicated that it couldn't come out de novo. It couldn't come out by itself. But now uh, we, we can easily say the compartments come in very soon then, but uh, first there must be something which is worth to be included into a compartment. And then we are left with the question, proteins or nucleic acids first? And it's very clear today, at least to us and to many others, Crick and who uh, had the idea first, that it's the nucleic acids. And we know even among the nucleic acids, it's not the DNA, but the RNA. Why? Well, the proteins are certainly the best catalysts you could think of. You can catalyze every reaction with you. Because the antibodies uh, are proteins and they can take, uh, 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 can form against anything they never have seen before, still today, and we make use of that when we. So uh, they, they are wonderful craftsmen's proteins. They can do everything, or intelligent watchmakers, or however you call them. But they can one property which they need, they can do. They can write and they can't read. And they, you have to be able to write and read if you want to start an evolutionary process. And so, so that's the nucleic acids. The DNA can only write and read. There are, there are no catalysts except some single-stranded DNA molecules which are able to fold. But the RNA, all, nearly all are. And one calls them ribozymes, similar word as enzymes. And so uh, we now will talk about the, uh, the nucleic acids. And uh, Charles Darwin, in a letter written in the last months of his life to a colleague in London, a zoologist and surgeon, George Wallich, confirmed, the, well, he, Wallich has found, are these properties, need not of this, he didn't know these substances, but he said, you invented the principle of natural selection. Is that uh, sufficient to explain also the origin of life? And he said, uh, uh, he left the question of the origin of life. And, uh, yeah, he said, I leave the question of the origin of life in my papers as, as uncanvassed as being altogether ultra virus. Do you say ultra virus or ultra virus? Ultra virus is a Latin <laughs> word at least. In the present state of our knowledge, present means his time. But then he added that he thought he somewhere might have said, and I quote again his words, that the principle of continuity renders it probable that the principle of life will be shown to be a part or consequence of some general law. So that the, this general law is responsible for both the origin of life and the evolution. And we think that this First of all, if it is a general law which should explain such questions, such regularities of matter, it must be a physical law, according to uh, Eugene Wigner. And uh, I believe that we have this law now. It's, it's a law in, in chemical kinetics. But... Um, 
the, of course, we, we are open to other ideas, but nobody so far could come about with it. So, so far this uh, uh, introduction, and I will now immediately come and in a half hour I have it now, yeah. Thank you, dear. To show how we determine the age of such a system. And the age of such a system is that at a very early time, they all were already involved, the proteins as well as the nucleic acids. But very clearly, it was the property of the nucleic acids which could bring about this system. How did we do it? You know, there is a small nucleic acid, a transfer nucleic acid, which uh, is the adapter for the amino acid. In other words, it changes a certain triplet uh, as an anticodon and uh, uh, brings the amino acid, which according to the genetic code belongs to this uh, to the codon of, of that and uh, makes a binding. That is done today by an enzyme system, which is well studied. And we have uh, looked at this transfer RNA in both. You know, each organism, you have the genetic code, is a triplet code of four bases, so it has 64 possibilities. But uh, every organism has only about 40. In, in other words, there's some redundancy in, in binding. Uh, but uh, we have tried to get many, uh, several organisms, the transfer RNAs of all the 40 transfer RNAs in that organism. And then we have looked at the phylogeny of single organism. In other words, we have looked, for instance, the human, uh, human uh, tRNA, let's say for glycine or for alanine, for a given amino acid, which goes through a phylogenetic tree. We see uh, branching of the organisms, the, the development came. Whereas the family of the uh, 40 or tRNAs in one organism did all this travel through phylogeny in the same organism. In other words, if it branched off, the whole family came, came out of it. And so, so we have two uh, time series which we can determine. And since uh, nowadays uh, some thousand tRNAs have been sequenced and, and uh, that we, we can do this for, at that time we had enough TNAs f for doing this analysis uh, and uh, the conclusion was well the analysis was done with some of uh, my co-workers together with a mathematician of, of uh, Bielefeld Andreas Dress uh, who happens to have a real interest in biological questions and, uh, and another co-worker in, in the, to, to getting the, the answer to it was Ruthild, who is sitting there. So, uh, in other words, you, there are many such amino acids, uh, such, yes, such uh, uh, code words to, for which you can put up the phylogenetic tree and, uh, and compare now the different, different tRNAs. And you see, by this you get also nodal sequences, except for the first node. And if you would get it for the first node, you could already say from this time series, about something about the age of the genetic code. So the 
question is this is an important answer we get but we need also the families which I said the 40 and the divergence of these is not a tree it's a bundle they, they, there are certain uh, mistakes made which look at some places that it is a little bit of branching but in general the and, and experimental values show this we looked at those, and you see, you have here the present. These are the only ones we can get, but we get very early ones from reconstructing the nodes in the, in the phylogenetic trees, and we know also the earliest point. And I can show you immediately the general result, which was for us very surprising, the distance from the earliest possible time to the nodes is less than one third, about a quarter even, only of the total distance up to the present time. So if the earliest possible time, well, our planet is 4.6 billion years old, uh, the chemistry had to develop in a planet so that is not much more than four billion years old, and uh, uh, these first nodes uh, come already at a time below three billion years old ago, that time uh, years ago. So it is only a small way to the first nodes of cells, where full cells existed up to the present time. And these are the quantitative values. And if you plot them now in a, in a kinetic curve, you see you have the eukary eukaryotes, the prokaryotes. They form groups, and you get very nice uh, data so that we can even give the error limit. And the biggest error limit is we, we must know from the geologists when the first cells might have occurred because this is something they, they can see in their stones and uh, of course we have this, this uh, uncertainty of, of the, that date. But uh, uh, we came up when we took all the data the time of 3.8 to 3.9 plus minus, what was it, uh, uh, 100,000 or so years. So it's, uh, uh, it's, it's clearly about the first decimal behind the uh, ESC. Uh, so th between 3.8 and 3.9, that is safe. In, in that. And this paper was published in, here in the States in Science, and uh, uh, but uh, it wasn't read by biologists because um, the comments of the uh, uh, reviewer of, of the manuscript said, don't these people know how to de de, uh, uh, how to construct a phylogenetic tree? I will be glad to send them my programs. And we, we told him back, we know that. And But uh, uh, you, your programs are made on the basis that it is a tree. And we did the whole mathematics of it. And the first decision was to make, is it a tree or is it a bundle or what is the topology of the, of the uh, thing. So, uh, so it, it wasn't really, most people didn't know the, the paper. But uh, the result is clear. Now, the result is clear, although the complexity is quite large. We, if we talk about the nucleic acids, the, the tree is a approximation, a very crude approximation. 
Well, it tries, uh, for instance, if you have three points and put them on a paper, uh, you have to sh demonstrate it in, in two dimensions. That is still possible. But if you have a, uh, uh, you see, if you have a sequence, a given sequence as the first one, then you have any of the n positions we have you have uh, three possibilities that you have another base and so you have a, co a corresponding high dimensional space of it and so we first had to develop theories for uh, tree construction or the analog of trees in high dimensional spaces and the way is uh, uh, very clear uh, I show it here with a binary, uh, with, with binary sequence. You, you, you could uh, consider nucleic acids always as binary sequences because the four bases you know, belong to two classes, the purines and the pyrimidines. And if you do any uh, com comparison, you never should mix up purines with pyrimidines because the pyrimidine, the, the, uh, the, the biologist calls these transitions and transversions. To change a base from one class to the other is much more difficult than to change it within the same class. Therefore, if you write any distance there, you have to do it separately for the transitions and the transversions. And that's what we did. We start here with a, with a you see that is when when you have only one position, then it's very clear. If you have two positions, you have just to double this and connect corresponding. So if you have three, you have to double this one and connect positions, and you can do that. Uh, you have an algorithm for do it for uh, everything. Now here I show you, which would be very difficult. The, we did it explicitly for a five-dimensional space, so we didn't stop with four-dimensional, five-dimensional. For higher dimension, you cannot show it. The paper would be black from, from all the possible connections, but you can calculate it, and, 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 that's the, and that was, of course, a cooperation with a mathematician. It's very helpful. Now, if you have uh, now the true space, not, uh, let's say, the four, uh, if you take the, uh, not a binary sequence, but a quaternary sequence, then you see each point in the, this is for three dimensions, so you have the eight points of, of a cube, and each has a subspace, which consists again of a binary space. Namely, the two possible pyrimidines and the two possible proteins. And that's how we, in this case, we could de determine the real age of the H virus. And, and it was always wrongly done because they were mixed together and, and you, you, you get some diagram which doesn't tell anything. So that problem was uh, solved. And now we come to the mechanism of it. The mechanism of, uh, uh, we must uh, do the kinetics of it. And then we, we have the formation kinetics for the nucleic acid strand and for the, the destruction, the terms, and we have to do this kinetics. And, and you, you see immediately uh, that must be a very complicated, make a very complicated set of equations because you have so many possible reactions there, also chemically many possibilities. And the funny thing which comes out, they are almost autocatalytic, so that for the growth curves you get always exponential functions. There are only few cases where we can really dissolve it into the two functions. That is in the process of infection of a bacterial cell by a virus. 
We have studied that very carefully in all the sets, and there we have found the the uh, different reactions which which made the the system uh, uh, s soluble. So in the end, uh, I've mentioned this. It comes out that Darwin was right with his answer to the letter in, in the letter to Wallach. He said, I cannot say it because I have only dealt with the uh, uh, normal uh, evolution of... of, of. But uh, I'm sure that there must be a general set of equations where both solutions come out. One which gives you evolution and the other which, which uh, uh, tells you the origin of, of it. And the, the question is uh, all solutions must be nonlinear. But nonlinear, what does it mean? We, we call it the dichotomy of genotype and phenotype. In other words, if you have a genotype, it must instruct the reaction. So it, the concentration of the genotype must enter the kinetic equation. At the same time, it must produce a phenotype, and that means which is, can be used for this reaction. And in an autocatalytic reaction, it should be the enzyme which does the autocatalytic uh, uh, acceleration. And we come out that this is already very difficult for DNA and RNA. For DNA and proteins, you would need the whole translation system at the same time where you can start in the origin. And that de novo, you can calculate the probabilities where 10 to the minus 300, 10 to the minus 1,000, and so on. That doesn't work. Where then we, we thought, what is if you take DNA, RNA? Well, that again has already a few enzymes involved and the probabilities were still to And you all would, wouldn't sit here if, if, we, uh, if your evolution would have gone this way. Then we have said, but what, what about if in the beginning the RNA was also a genotype? And that is the, the uh, RNA world. And that works. All, so, you, so you would say then you don't need a nonlinear mechanism because the, uh, uh, if it is the same molecule, yes, but the, the same molecule cannot at the same time being the template and the polymerase. <laughs> you need a second RNA molecule of the same class if you want, uh, but you need two more, so it starts with a quadratic term that is not linear anymore. But these come at pretty low concentrations already to that one is saturated and later in biology you have all this uh, uh, homeostasis uh, uh, mechanism. So that one becomes constant. And our experiments, which I show later, uh, were, were done with, uh, where we provided the system with a full translation system, then you can make it also for the, for the protein. So here I have a, a simplified picture of the strand. You have here, I is the information carrier, so that's a template. E is the enzyme, that is the phenotype that, that is made. Um, and if you have uh, uh, the enzyme system as a constant factor there, then you have a simple linear set of linear equations. Linear equations means your autocatalysis contains only the concentration 
of the autocatalyst. I had a long discussion with Dick Feynman about this. He said, this is nonsense. In, in biology, we, we always have a po potential series. And then, yes, I said, but we, in, in, in physics, I mean, in biology, the constant term is missing everywhere. Because the constant term means how constant is, uh, uh, how frequent is a given sequence in comparison with all possible sequences. And there's a factor 10 to the minus 300, 10 to the minus 1,000. You can completely neglect this. It must not be there, otherwise the mechanism wouldn't work at all. So you have no constant term. The next is a linear, that's the autocatalytic term. But it cannot contain the t uh, two terms of, of, of uh, let's say, a template and something which uh, does a certain reaction with the template. You must either have made it constant by uh, uh, letting it grow faster or uh, at least uh, differently. And uh, if you measure the growth rates, they are exponential. And that's a linear differential equation. If they were uh, quadratic, we have done these solutions too. And somewhere beyond the grid, but they are all hyperbolic already. They have singularities and, and so on. And there where we could do the measurements, we have determined. Those. So that's that's what we have done then. Uh, this is three Uhr. Oh je, da muss ich aufhören, oder? <laughs> yes, I, I uh, <laughs> thought this is possible. That we can skip, that we don't know, but I wanted to. Oh, well, I want to tell the physicists a little bit about this uh, system. This is the relative concentration x is the, uh, uh, divided by the total molecules. That means x is a number which runs from 0 to 1. And you see, uh, this is the formation term. It now, this is the... Uh, autocatalytic replication. It has an amplification term, which is, has a, a, a matrix for the uh, accuracy. Uh, you, you make uh, error matrix. And minus the uh, destruction rate. But they are all first order, and therefore they are all proportional to the x. You see, the, these are the, right there, the x, the. the. Here I have already written it in vectorial form because time is short. We have first done it, of course, in single uh, uh, systems. And uh, Now, that, that uh, do you have now to add a flux term, and otherwise you don't get the selection in which this average evolution comes, and this, this is the term which comes in through the flux term. And you see, this is a highly nonlinear equation, because this really contains a whole series of, of, of terms, from linear up to uh, quite high powers, if you want. And then um, the question is, why is it? Why should be this a system of linear equations? Well, there are two ways. Uh, if you insist in doing it very generally, you can make a transformation. And this was done. Well, I, I must tell you, I gave a lecture at the Rockefeller, and Mark Katz, the mathematician, uh, was present. I, I knew him also personally, and and. Uh, he said later, well, I did this with uh, perturbation theory, it's a solution. He said, I think that the equation can be solved generally. For, uh, and then uh, that was the 
solution which came out. You have to go to a variable z, where you have the exponential of the integral over this average formation, and then you get an equation which really is a linear one. Now you have to transform it back in order to get the normal modes. Why are the normal modes? And then you see that it's a solution of this equation. And you see immediately that this is a definition of natural selection. It's a purely physical definition because those solutions, it has, uh, if you have 10 to the 300 such equations, they all, you get also something in the order of, uh, not quite, but almost, uh, on eigenvalues from this. And uh, those who have an eigenvalue larger than the average of all eigenvalues, have a negative term that they die out. Those which are larger have a positive term that means they increase the average. And that goes on and on until one remains. And at that moment we found out that this was a theorem which in 1890 Perron and Frobenius have. So they have said this type of differential equation has only one stable eigenvalue, namely the largest one in the system. And that's the reason why Darwin is correct. There's one fittest, but it's an eigenvalue. And this eigenvalue certainly contains contributions from all populated sequences. And uh, uh, it turns out that uh, the largest part of the systems we have studied can be solved this way. I had now several examples which I wanted to show you, but I think I should keep a little bit to the time. And uh, so I will not go on with this one here. Oh, this is one important thing. I can only now say this. Um, this has a threshold solution. Again, something I was not in agreement with Dick Feynman, but later on could show it to him. It was so that we were together at a meeting and we went to bed, and he, in the morning at breakfast, he said, I made calculations, and I was right. And he said, I made calculation and I was right. So I showed him. He said, oh, but if you make such a simple assumption, then of course, he said, yes, in biology, you have to make this assumption. No other does work. And uh, this has a threshold. In other words, selection is not like a chemical transition. You go to one uh, concentration. I can show you the curves without having the time to explain them. These are a model calculation by Peter Schuster, Schuster and Svetina, with a small sequence, only 50 nucleotides. This is a wild type, and you see uh, the, these are f f the uh, jump is 15 orders of magnitude. Yeah, who said I should use this thing? Otherwise, you see nothing. <laughs> and if you do it, the one wild type is in concurrence with this whole mutant spectrum. The green curve is the one, and the two. According to all criteria, it's a phase transition of the first order. It's a real true, uh, as you have it in, in liquid uh, 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 gas. This is the sum curve of it. There are all the mutants here. And that is how the, and here it loses stability and you get random. Uh, arrangement. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's really, uh, and, and the funny thing is, 
we found out that there are so many neutral mutants, I have told you already. They also make this transition, but it gets a critical phase transition. You know that uh, 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 Wilson, he, he got a Nobel Prize last uh, century, uh, in 18, 1983 or so, uh, uh, using the renormalization uh, group to, to show that this is a theory of phase transitions. And that's exactly applicable to selection. If you have your phase transition with, uh, this is, you know, liquid, liquid gas uh, transition at the critical point has this critical opalescence and has, has that means macroscopic fluctuations and, and the same you have here. And that means uh, you can now, by this, scan through the whole mutant spectrum via these large fluctuations at the critical point. So in liquid gas transition, the density of the liquid becomes equal to the density of the gas, or the density of the gas becomes equal to the density of liquid, let's say. And here, it means simply the, the fitness value are equal, and then you are always at the at the, at the uh, critical point, and you have a critical phase transition. So that's uh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. This I, I don't. Here we, we made an experiment which showed that it's really the eigenvalues uh, which which count. And as I told you before that you can have, have a mutant distribution which is symmetrically arranged around a wild type uh, when the wild type even has a population number zero. It is a peak in the distribution and appears as, as a selected, selected sequence. So th all I'm saying, the result is that formally, Darwin had the right thing, and he couldn't know the other things because, as I said, he didn't know anything about molecules, and, and uh, they came they were yeah, as they were shown as around that time. But uh, uh, the detail is different. There is no fittest individual. There is no wild type. There is only a fittest population, and. Uh, this is something which is uh, uh, quite interesting. So we have applied all the physical criteria, and this is a typical example where this uh, uh, hold. Uh, there was one thing I was going. Yes, the question is. I tried. To, I could try to go quickly through it. Could I have another five minutes or? Not, better not. Yes. I mean, I will just tell you in one sentence, but what we did is an experiment where we used a phage, infect, a phage infection. We used our, uh, our uh, what is our house tier? Our, Pet, our pet, yes, phage, phage Q beta. It, 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 it infects coli cells. We know much about coli, and we know everything about Q beta. Uh, who, the man who discovered these properties was Sol Spiegelman. We were good friends, but he died very early in, on pancreas cancer. But uh, so what we did is, um, the infection process is a very complicated process. The, the phage has to go to one of the pili, pili, or as you say, the, um, then injects its nucleic acid. The nucleic acid has to be translated by the ribosomes of the host cell. Then uh, there are about 10 to 20,000 ribosomes in the host cell. 
and uh, so it's it's a, overall mechanism is complicated, but we can do it with a uh, with a equation, yes, which showed that there is a, just one curve, yes. So what we did, we looked the production of proteins and the production of nucleic acids by enzymes, by radioactive labeled, and uh, had a special way of uh, uh, doing the, the infection in stepwise. And then you see what you have here, that is a hyperbolic type of uh, change. Uh, Exponential change will, would start with a linear uh, member, and, and you see that's how RNA, RNA and protein grow with the same speed. Up the RNA becomes equal in contrast to the protein. Then you have a point, uh, and this is what is plotted as a rate against the time after infection. Then it produces for about 40 minutes, and uh, it comes out only with 10, 20,000 uh, uh, phage particles again, of which only 1% or a few percent are infectious again because of the increasing error rate of, of that. But uh, with that, we could show by the existence of this. This is a hypercycle. This is a nonlinear part of the. From there on, everything is linear. And what counts in the end is that each infection yields you a, a constant amount autocatalytically of phage particles. And so the growth curves, the overall growth curves of phage, is exponential. As the human growth curve is exponential. And now to, to produce a child uh, <laughs> includes such a complicated chemistry that it would be really uh, something to, to say this must be all linear reactions. No, there are certain steps which are reached which makes the system. And it comes out that the Darwinian principle would not work if it were not linear, because uh, the mutant, the first mutant which comes up, has to compete with the total population of the formerly selected uh, wild type. And that is possible only in the linear system. Any higher uh, 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 higher order term would, would uh, make that impossible. So uh, you see the lot of new answers. First of all, the RNA world is probably the right way to uh, as the origin of life occurred. And uh, the interpretation which has been given so far has to be cor corrected into uh, more properties of the population than of the individual in the population. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so there are, there are biologists in this room who might have a question. Um, and we have coffee now, and people are going off to get the cookies. So we could postpone most of the questions unless there are a few or objections. Good. Let's speak up so we can hear you. And don't speak too fast. <laughs> Is that okay? In our advanced society, we are modifying very much the natural selection. Uh, for instance, we are doing beautiful things as allowing um, uh, disabled child to live, 
or we are helping the reproduction of people who has, who have problems, or helping people with cancer and so on. That's very typical uh, diseases that are um, uh, controlling our lives. Oh, yeah. So, so uh, in the long term, so millennium, these things uh, uh, will help us to survive the human being or not. Or we can uh, think about uh, an evolution of the Darwin theory towards a milder, softer kind of selection. Well, uh, uh, you are entirely right. And as I said, this, the whole problem of uh, origin of life will uh, uh, be of interest for many more generations. That's, I tell always the young people, so they should not give up <laughs> There are enough problems for them to do. There are many nonlinear problems which appear on the way. But as I said, if, if a population really grows up, then the overall picture is so that the linear, even the linear approximation is a good approximation. Otherwise, our population would not grow exponentially. It wouldn't grow at all, or it would grow hyperbolically with singularities, and that is not the case. At least uh, since uh, it came out that the age of the life of all organisms together is four billion years, it hasn't occurred in four billion years. And there's no other example for that. That's all I can say on that. I pick up one. The advanced society is not growing exponentially. They are also decaying. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so we, have, we have measured Central the Europe, we have population this grows very, very carefully in human populations, of course. There, there were periods where the medical uh, treatment, where uh, uh, the food production uh, came uh, uh, in so that you had clear smaller deviations from exponential. But to, to answer the questions which I have raised, it is sufficient to, to look at this case of, and you can say from these measurements that is almost ex uh, exponential that there are not large deviations from it. But there, there are many nonlinear problems, and I think since we are going to apply these problems also to the selection in the central nervous system, because there also the pro producing information there is also a, a selection process. We are expecting there are lots of nonlinear problems, quite clearly. I have a simple question, I think. Uh, what is the mechanism by which the changes in, the, in life have taken place which allows you to determine that the age is uh, four billion years? What is the mechanism that, where is the clock? The, the, I don't think that there is a clock in that because uh, different organisms evolve in different times. So we, we can only say what is the, the longest time for, the, for organisms which are pa parts of the whole system because they have the same genetic code. As you know, the genetic code essentially for coli cells is the same as our genetic code. And we can say when is the first time that this could come about in, in, in the diagrams I have shown to you, and that's four billion years. It, it leaves you enough individual deviations uh, which we don't see yet, uh, so easily and uh, which one then can clarify. And we have in single problems, uh, could I tell you, many nonlinear <laughs> 
problem where the solution is only possible with nonlinear equations. Another way of answering that, which might satisfy him, is that if you discover somebody tells you that he's your second cousin or cousin, say, then you can estimate quite precisely when you had a common, first common ancestor. That's a general idea. Well, that's certainly a very simple answer to the question. But is that, is that actually analogous to well, the... Well, it's uh, more complicated, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if, if you ask me what is the problem of biology, then the answer is complexity, of course. That was a problem which had to be solved. And in that problem, the information came in, and that is the, the, uh, the origin of, uh, of uh, uh, information which has a meaning. Um, what you do with sense theory is uh, the entropy. You know, there was, um, Shannon was going to von Neumann to ask, um, he called his uh, property not information, he called it uncertainty. And von Neumann saw immediately that his equations looked like the statistical mechanics expression for entropy and said, why don't you call it entropy? Then you have always an advantage in discussion because most people don't know what entropy is. <laughs> So I, I suggest we uh, adjourn to the coffee before the cookies disappear completely. And continue the session. <laughs>